Hi all, I'm Brian Mann from the Humanize Group and welcome to our delivery forum. Creating high performance teams and organisations. The challenges, the solutions and the future. The purpose for not just tonight's forum but also our future forums, uh, which we are hoping to host every two to three months, it's really to connect with the delivery community. Project managers, program managers, capability managers, change managers, transformation, everyone. And really, I guess try to address the questions that everyone's asking. What's working? What isn't? Be able to ask the questions of our peers, or your peers, uh, and try to get some answers from it. Uh, so hopefully we can actually have some answers, uh, well, some questions answered tonight. Uh, unfortunately, due to COVID, uh, we are filming this behind closed doors. Uh, but hopefully, you know, we don't know, but hopefully the doors can open up sooner rather than later. While on the topic of COVID, uh, unfortunately, Adam Skinner, um, CTO from Citrusad, he's had to pull out just due to, pre, pre, uh, I guess, precautions of the situation. So we're wishing him the best of health. Uh, but without further ado, let me welcome and introduce our panellists, Danny Chincher. Capability Executive from Bank of Queensland. Uh, Danny, we met earlier this year. I think, mate, you are probably one of the most well-known people in Brisbane uh, in projects. Uh, you have a very diverse projects background, so I'm very much looking forward to your, your insights. Thanks, bro. Peter Sheffer, uh, Business Engagement and Program Manager at ERM Power. Peter, we, I think our, our Brisbane adventure started around the same time, uh, early last year. Uh, we've always spoken about, I guess, the differences of Sydney, Melbourne market compared to Brisbane, and Agile has always popped up in that, so I'm sure we're going to touch on that one tonight. And Emma Haller, National Digital Lead, Integral Technology Solutions. Emma, we met very recently uh, in regards to a executive uh, change or transformation position I had. You were kind enough to pass on some, I guess, uh, candidates who you thought were suitable. Uh, but then also, I guess your insights into the Brisbane market have been quite, quite well, they've been great. So welcome and thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I'll pass this on to the floor now, just so uh, everyone can do a quick introduction about yourselves, because you will do it better than I do. <laughs> um, Emma, we'll start with you, then Danny, then Peter. I think it'd be more fun if you did it. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'll be too kind. <laughs> I'm Emma Haller. I've been um, in digital for over 20 years. I was very fortunate to start in the early days. Um, I was in a... Uh, internet business in Ireland uh, through the dot com era and co host co locating and hosting and doing all sorts of really amazing folks stuff trying to build our own products and seen really all sides of digital. It, it's taken me a long time to find to understand and articulate my sweet spot, but what I think it is is um, customer experience. I try to look at what a human experience could be like and then how to translate that into digital channels. So um, thinking about the best experience you've ever had in your life. A lot of people, it is going to get a coffee where the barista knows their name and gets their order prepared. So how do you try and translate that into a really nice digital experience to keep people coming back and grab their attention within that vital first six, uh, eight seconds? Danny? Uh, yeah, so uh, Danny Timpshire, I um, uh, work for BOQ, uh, roles a capability executive. Um, I guess I've been in the um, banking and finance industry for 25 years, um, and uh, about 15 years um, of that uh, in project uh, in the project space, um, and most of the time uh, in leadership um, people leadership positions. I guess that's really my, my passion is around uh, managing people, um, and really focused on um, you know, how do I um, you know, build their capabilities and uh, and also um, uh, you know, remove any barriers to, to them um, reaching their full potential. Great, Peter. Uh, so Peter Sheffer with ERM Power, which is an energy uh, retailer here in Brisbane. Um, uh, I've had a varied uh, career, I guess, where I've started out as a software developer dating back to about 98. Um, transitioned into business analyses and things like testing and iteration management, shifted into an agile path. And found myself more recently in program management roles, leading teams and, um, and, and in transformation uh, positions. Um, I, I enjoy pushing the boundaries and trying to get the best out of teams and uh, looking forward to where we can you know, uh, make better improvements and be, have a better outcome. Fantastic. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Um, well, let's get started. Uh, 
Having spoken to what feels like a, a million people, predominantly in the Brisbane market, and uh, haven't asked what people do want to know about, these are the top three topics. I am going to look down on these ones. Agile, or well, number one, Agile appears to be in decline or going out of favour. What do people see are the leading causes for this? Number two, what challenges are leaders experiencing with implementing Agile? Is it team, frozen middle layer, financial planning, skills, knowledge, fear? And number three, which is really going to I guess, appeal to everyone, is the conditions imposed by a worldwide pandemic has it added complexity to how we build or even maintain high-performing organisations. High-performing teams in an office environment with structure and face-to-face -face interaction as opposed to high-performing teams working from home offices alone is greatly different. What is going to happen? Where do you see it's going to happen? So, and we'll leave that one to last because I think that will probably be the longest one. Um, so let's go back to the first topic. Uh, Emma, I'm going to start with you on this one. Agile appears to be in decline or going out of favour. What do people see or what do you see are the leading factors on this? I'm not convinced it is on the decline. Okay. Um, we get a lot of requests to run projects in an agile fashion. Sometimes within the environment, the business construct, it, it's prohibited. So I think to understand the cadence of the business and the cadence of product projects are very different. And to know if the business is setting a strategy and it's maybe a three year strategy, well, they're not really interested in two week sprints and they couldn't possibly do that. So how do you translate the strategy into separate chunks so that you can actually deliver for projects and get the, um, the business availability to give the input into the projects in the correct way? And I think that's where it's just not really happening. People aren't considering it up front. Agile is thought of as, oh yeah, and we want it to be agile. They don't really understand that agile is doing. You need to be agile. You don't just need to practice agile. So that mindset just isn't there. It's a real legacy mindset in most of the organizations that I've seen. Okay. I mean, Peter, I think you've touched on previously in our couple of discussions about being legacy or you know, what are the, I guess, difficulties. What's your take on this? Uh, look, uh, what I've seen in markets like Melbourne and Sydney is a reversal a little bit from they went really gangbusters on Agile. Mm -hmm. And the language is wound back a little bit where they refer now to ways of working and the Agile terminology is being dropped. Um, <coughs> I think at the heart of that, there's a desire uh, to still have something of constraints or controls over delivery uh, of projects as a mechanism. And perhaps Agile has not fulfilled uh, the needs of the stakeholders, that they get what they want to go, this is on track and we can see where it's progressing, we can see where it's going to wind up. And I think without that ability, there's, there's a lack of confidence. And, and Without being, you know, able to talk to them directly, I, I think maybe that's where the influences come from. That perhaps people are stepping back from that terminology that we deliver agile. Um, while there is still an appetite for it, to your point, that people are still interested in, there's still the roles out there for it. There's still the training and the support in the communities. Um, so it's, uh, I wonder where in the organisation there's that stepping back. I guess. Yeah, I, I think in my experience, um, agile is seen as a as a toolkit and. Um, just walking around the, the, the floors uh, in the office there, you'll see um, not only project areas, but also areas of the business, um, having their daily scrums and, and, and Kanban walls all over the place. So I think it's, um, yeah, Agile is probably starting to be a dirty word uh, in, in a lot of areas. But, um, but certainly you're still seeing that, um, you know, uh, elements of the methodology are in, um, in place and um, I don't see them going in, uh, go away anyway. Do you think there's a difference between um, it's been a very bottom-up appro approach with pro project work, especially trying to get agile into the business because somebody's experienced it elsewhere? Mm. Um, if that's not top down, do you think it's just always going to be doomed? And yeah, that, that, that's a, that's a real challenge. I think if we d we don't have that executive buy-in mm. and um, uh, and there's a, a, a clear understanding around how it's going to get delivered and and, um, and and the approach we take and and also the, the, the you know the financial management of um, of projects running Agile, um, yeah, that, that uh, if you don't have that top-down approach, then uh, they really struggle. Mm. And have you got it then embedded across the elements of the business as well? Uh, yeah, as I said, there's um, different aspects. Um, certain things like um, 
you know, fail fast, fail often. Uh, uh, you know, mentioned Scrum and um, and Kanban. Mm. Um, really, just um, you know, the testing and, and, and the different approaches. Yeah, we're seeing it across uh, across the board there. Mm. I think the feel fast is an interesting one. Mm. Being alive to feel. Mm, yes. Feeling safe to feel. Yeah, I think that is massive, and it's just not there in a lot of companies. Yes. Yeah. How do you feel, organisations as a whole, especially with larger organisations? Are you allowed to do that, or is it independent from each business to business? I mean, yeah, Q, you have, were you, you, you've been allowed to fail. Yeah, I think that's um, in most of the organisations I've been in. Um, you, know, you look at the the company values, and, and it talks to um, being you know safe to fail, uh, safe to fail, and um, an organisation where um, you, know, you, um, uh, you 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 want your people to take risks, yep. um, but I guess it, it comes down to when um, when you do have these uh, situations where things haven't gone to plan, uh, and it's how um, how the leaders and management um, uh, approach that and how they handle it, and that uh, really uh, demonstrates that you know the, the culture you're looking for. Um, you, you want people to feel safe and um, uh, and not not scared to uh, to fail. I think to your point earlier, it needs to be driven from top down that <clears throat> someone's creating uh, an environment that's a safe space for mm -hmm. failure and, and to learn from that because it can't be driven from the bottom up, uh, I think. So there needs to be someone there in, in there and creating that language and that safe space to go, all right, then we're, we're happy for this to occur as long as we learn from it. Yeah. Do you think maybe Agile has morphed over it, maybe evolved like everything else, but have, have we forgotten what the original concept was about? You know, small lean teams mm. cutting through some of the bureaucracy and the levels of, of different management and getting people together to work on a project. I, I, I'm not seeing that that often. No, no um, the, the early projects uh, that were run agile, um, you know, 10, 15 years ago, mm. very different to you know the you know, what you see now. Yeah. yeah. What do you see the differences? Um, I, I guess that you know the small teams is, is one of those things that that was the, the intention. You know, not, not small mobile teams. Um, and uh, I think things are evolving, and um, you know, we're finding that uh, we're in a situation that's it's you know it's it's not uh, not as the, the agile of before. Um, we certainly hadn't gone back to a waterfall, but mm. um, you know, we just uh, find what works, and, um, mm. and and sometimes that's more on the waterfall side, and and, uh, and for other projects, it's on the closer to agile. And a question to you both is: agile more tailored or customized? Um, suitable to specific projects. So in the digital space, it's easier to have smaller teams, customer facing, high interaction, high feedback. Whereas with your back end systems, perhaps it's very hard. You have to have a lot of specialist knowledge and group of people together, mm. and you have more of a long term planning type of approach. Is that what you're seeing? Yeah, I guess the, um, in, in my experience, it's um, when you deal with a number of uh, vendors, uh, they'll operate on a um, statement of work basis. Um, so they want something. Um, documented, they'll deliver to the specific scope that we've agreed, and uh, and and that is, is um, makes it a little bit more difficult for us to, to work in an agile fashion. It's not not impossible. We'll, we'll find ways around that, but um, um, that that's one of the challenges is when um, your, your your partners and vendors aren't working in an agile fashion either. Mm -hmm. Also, if you're integrating with different areas of the business or even other businesses. They, you have no control over what their release pattern is. Mm. That could be once every six months for all you know. So you've got to take all of these factors into consideration. I think a big one for me that I've learned over the years is availability of SMEs. Those SMEs are getting pulled in every direction and sometimes they're not being backfilled as well within the business. Mm. And that's why a lot of projects I see just say either coming to a grinding halt or slowing down quite significantly. Yeah. Yeah. One question that was asked a number of times um, was, you, you will know this better than I do, but you spoke about legacy, agile as a legacy, thought process or methodology, and the way it was brought up was different to now because we, we've got different tools now. Mm. The, the tools we have now make agile redundant. What are your thoughts on that? It's all about getting the team together yes. and trying to achieve a goal, knowing how those goals then contribute to the larger goals which contribute to the strategy. Mm. And th if, those dis if those are disconnected, well then of course whatever Agile project you're thinking about, it's just going to fail because it's yep. Agile potentially for the sake of it. So unless you get you know, buy-in across everything, it's... it's um, hmm. 
Yeah, I think you know, the um, concepts around Agile where you, um, you know, plan the work, visualise the work, those things, um, it doesn't matter which tools you use, whether they're um, you know, walls or um, your, your, your uh, digital um, uh, tools there, I think it's, um, it comes back to the original uh, you know, concepts of what you're trying to achieve through that. Without those people's ne people and interactions, you, it doesn't matter what tools you have, you're not going to get the right outcome. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, it's them collaborating that gets the result. Mm. And a lot of it is having the human thought in there. That's what I really like about these types of projects as well, that you, you can't take the humans out of it. They're the ones that contribute the most value. Mm. So having everything done and agreed in a really productive environment just makes so much sense. Well, we've touched on it a couple of times, but um, I might move this one to you, but what challenges are leaders experiencing with implementing Agile? And these are the ones. So is it team? Frozen middle layer, financial planning, skills, knowledge, fear. What are your What are your feelings on this? I think it can be all of those things when you come into an organisation and they're first finding their feet with with agile. That you have perhaps a very um, legacy thinking CFO who wants projects delivered a certain way and certain times and certain outcomes and to report on those that prevents you from moving into an agile uh, manner. Um, I think that you know if you don't have the right level of understanding at a base level across the teams, they're going to struggle with Agile and they're going to try it and they're probably not going to succeed. And if they continue down that path and they don't have an opportunity to improve through training and having the right people in there, eventually managers are going to look at it and go, well, this is not working. Yeah. What do we need to do? Let's reverse this back out. Um, those are probably the two predominant things. Uh, there's also things like the actual underlying technology quite often can prevent you from being able to do small incremental releases and I think those things are the things you have to overcome first before you get into a position where you're doing your regular cadence of, of delivery and deployment and, you know, and going into those agile processes. Those are the ones that I've seen have held organisations back, I think. Okay. Great. I might move this one to you, Danny, because you, you've done it recently, but what, what did you find that the main barriers were? Yeah, I think the um, when I look at agile projects that um, haven't been successful, it's when they've um, the teams come together and they've just started work and they haven't taken the time to do a proper mobilisation, understand, uh, you know, get a get a shared understanding about the problem we're trying to solve, uh, who's going to be involved, you know, what's explicitly in and out of scope, um, you know, what's just good enough to deliver, mm -hmm. um, you know, the social contracts and all of those um, those aspects. I think. The, um, the projects that I've seen haven't been successful, haven't had that um, uh, initial uh, uh, mobilisation or, or conceptual kickoff. Um, so, so that's something that I've, I've been um, very, um, very large on in, in you know, bringing bring in, ensuring the projects do take the time uh, up front to, to have that. And look, things will change and we, and we, we expect that um, uh, all of the, um, you know, the, the scope items are all, always up for, um, up for review, but um, uh, you really need to, to start from a, a point of shared understanding. Okay. Yeah, and the value of whatever you're trying to deliver. Um, if you don't know exactly what that value is, you don't know how you're contributing and you don't know how it's going to go, you need to look at it from Agile is just a, a process, it's a methodology. If you don't know the big business problem, if you don't know how it fits in, how you're going to solve it, exactly everything that's needed and how it fits into the greater piece of the puzzle, well then it's doomed to fail anyway, mm -hmm. regardless of whatever delivery method you have. I did um, convince some senior stakeholders to go for an Agile project. They'd never, they'd heard of Agile, they'd never done anything Agile before. They were absolutely terrified, completely petrified, because <laughs> they just didn't know what to expect, what it meant for them, and even to have their input on a very regular basis was, was what was impossible, it had to be a little bit of wajab. <laughs> so yeah, staying within a very waterfall framework, especially when it came to reporting and board meetings and steering groups and, and things like that, but having an agile delivery team underneath. Do you feel there's a real barrier to adoption because of the, the, the language and the obfuscation that it creates that, you know, I don't know what a story point is, I don't know what a scrum master is, how do I know who to go to and how do I know if it's on track or not, those sorts of things? Well, I think the... Um yeah, you know, whenever I'm recruiting candidates, pretty much everyone comes in and they've, they've worked in agile environments before. But I think at the uh, you know, senior stakeholder level, that, that's where you can have some of that uh, limitation and understanding about uh, some of those things. And, and, and that's where I think some of the fear comes from as well. Yeah. How have you both overcome that in the past? What, what things have you used to try and drive the change? 
Oh my goodness, so so many different. So a lot of really trying to educate at the very beginning as to what the process is. So what's the big picture of a particular transformation? What's the reason for the transformation? And keep bringing it back to how we're actually contributing to solve that reason for the transformation. Um, and then just very gently taking them through what agile process are, the various different roles people need to play, what their particular responsibilities are. Um, so a lot of them just don't understand even from a normal waterfall project perspective, what roles that they have to play because they're business people instead of project people. Mm -hmm. And trying to educate people as to, well, now we're going to do things this way. Well, why? It's been fine for me that way. I only didn't, I didn't need to have too much to do with it. But yeah, the benefits of seeing the visibility of being able to halt things if they go too far, mm -hmm. being able to, to be, well, be agile, mm -hmm. really. And if we could take out a lot of the jargon that confuses um, senior executives, I think it would be a lot of an easier process. A lot of the people who will be watching this forum will be middle management. Um, Emma, we touched on this about frozen middle layer. Uh, I think it was, a, it was a big subject for you. Mm -hmm. um, I might just list some of the things you've put here. Uh, some of these things are where it comes to freeze. Uh, having to recognise that the way they lead at the moment is not working. Mm. Tough one. Wanting the org or systems to change, that not, uh, but not them personally. Yeah. Uh, having to admit to poor decisions previously made. Fear or losing control. Lack of understanding of new technologies, you've touched on this. Lack of new technologies or even new terminology and not wanting to admit they don't understand. I think that's a huge one. Um, mm -hmm. No one wants to admit that. Uh, and then also not being client or customer centric. Yeah. When we're looking at middle management and then freezing, what, what advice can you give them right now? I guess this goes to everyone. I think it's to actually quantify the problem. So if you can find out what the problem is and measure it, and then say, this is what we're going to change. This is what we're heading for. This is what you should expect out of this. Then it's a lot easier. If you don't have that um, quantification at the beginning, then you don't really have very much from a benchmarking perspective as to what you're trying to change and what the impact's going to be in the organisation. If people are data averse, which I've seen quite often, especially around the Brisbane market, they just haven't seemed to realise the power that you can get out of having really great insights mm -hmm. um, and how you can use those to your advantage. So I would say, look at the data, see what the problem is. It doesn't matter what happened, what caused the problem. It doesn't matter. You just know it's there and move on from there. Things happen. <laughs> yeah, I think um, we just essentially you identify it early and, and you deal with it because the longer you leave it, the um, more detrimental it will become. Okay. I think those middle managers also can feel that they don't have a role. When you have a look at Agile, it's very much pushed down the hierarchy and mm. all of the, the teams or the squads have all the roles that they need okay. and therefore what role does the middle manager play? And the things that I've heard in the past is you, as a middle major, you become the unblocker and you make sure teams have what they need. And that's a permanent thing that you just need ongoing. There's always things that are thrown uh, in the way that's going to slow things down or block them. I mean, I read this and you know, I'll, I'll have a little laugh at this, but I read these as probably the issues of why most of my relationships have failed. You know, I was like, <laughs> For example, well, I haven't even spoken to you yet and you've put them all down. So, you know, it, it is one of those things. Yeah. So, Lack of terminology is communication. Yeah. You know, it is fear of not being wrong or, or of being wrong. So, you know. it's how you know whenever you're sitting in a, in a boardroom, and if somebody asks for a briefing note, then you know that they haven't understood. Or yeah. if they all sit and nod, then you go, yeah, nobody's getting it here. Yeah. Let's go back to basics again. Some of the best advice I ever got um, was <laughs> quite funny actually. It was treat treat me and all the other executives or the board members like goldfish. We've got an eight second memory span. What were we talking about before? <laughs> what do you want to talk about now? And what are the next steps? And just keep going through the story yeah. again and again and again. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, I think we all admit it's, we'd rather have people work for us or you know, ask questions if they don't know. Mm. Because if, to get them to understand, or get people to understand, if they don't understand, gosh, you can take forever. So if they ask the question straight away, it's so much quicker, so much easier. But get most a, people don't want to. They don't want to feel silly. They don't want to be that one asking the question and, and everyone, especially if someone goes, oh, you know, do you understand? Go, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, I said, like I said, previous relationships, you know, so, you know, so the... <laughs> Have you learned though? Did you do a retro? Oh, look, I'm still not married, so, you know. <laughs>
maybe one day with some lucky lady. Um, <laughs> Danny, did you want to expand on that at all? Nothing. No. <laughs> no, that's no, okay. Yeah. Not the relationship. You'll, you'll love off now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, all right, well, I think we, uh, we've, we've probably addressed the agile part a bit. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're in agreement that it's not dead. It's just about how we're doing it. Uh, are we missing the mark? Are we, are we forgetting what the principles are and do we need to go back to it? Um, and then also uh, addressing what we don't know. Um, so if I could just add, um, something was brought to my attention earlier today that a lot of people see Agile and the ceremonies as a religion hmm. and they don't like it. They don't like being forced to do silly things like talking sticks or, um, you know, they, they just don't like it. And maybe we should find out what people like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. what they like to work with and then just have a, a solution that's not, that's more your own. Mm -hmm. As long as it works, it doesn't really have to be pure anything. Yeah, that's true. Even just the word ceremonies. Like yeah. I've had, what, what, what are these ceremonies and yeah. what are you doing and why? Yeah. <laughs> why aren't you doing your work? And when you do it, it makes perfect sense. But whenever you talk about it, you just sound silly. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, well, we'll move on to the last topic because this, this is one that we definitely can go on for days about. Uh, but I will re-ask it. Um, the conditions imposed by a worldwide pandemic has added complexity to how we build or even maintain high-performing organisations. High-performing teams in an, in an office environment with structure and face-to-face -face interaction as opposed to high-performing teams working from home offices alone is greatly different. Uh, I think all three of you have had, you've, you've experienced a change uh, from going from office. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave this one quite open. Where do you think we're going to have to go, or where do you think we're going? But then also, how have you found the changes so far? Uh, Danny, I'll go with you then. <laughs> That's fine. Look, um, I'll be the first to admit that um, I was pleasantly surprised um, when I um, realised that, that, I guess um, what I'm trying to say is, when uh, when all this started, it was very uh, last minute. So we, we weren't prepared for this and certainly weren't prepared for how quickly this, things were going to evolve. So one day we're all in, in the office making sure we're washing our hands and you know, um, weekend comes the next day, no one's in the office. So everyone's working from home, uh, it's mandated. So I guess um, I'll be the first to admit that I wasn't, I wasn't expecting, or I was expecting that um, you know, delivery was going to slow. That we were going to be... Um, yeah, have uh, lower velocity in terms of what we'd be able to deliver um, mm -hmm. because of the, the remoteness. And um, I'm, I, I've got to say that uh, it was it was the opposite. Mm -hmm. Now um, I, I'm putting it down to the fact that you know we're not um, having to commute. Um, that uh, you know where um, people are getting up and um, getting into work um, earlier uh, because you don't have that hour um, uh, each, each way, uh, so they're spending more time. Um, but also I, I guess it's um, Dealing with the um, you know, the lack of engagement and interaction with your with your peers in the office um, is a challenge, but in some respects it's also a distraction. So um, I've found that um, personally, uh, I have far less uh, people um, um, bothering me, uh, for want of a better word, um, which would be things like just uh, ad hoc, just even walking down the corridor, mm. uh, someone will see me and grab me, ask me a question, might be work related, might not, and it's amazing how many of these small inter uh, interruptions add up to uh, a big chunk of the day when I'm not doing what I, I should be doing. So um, uh, I think we're, we're lucky in uh, some respects that um, we've got the tools that enable us uh, through WebEx and, uh, and other tools like that to um, effectively be able to still do stand-ups um, and still come together as a team, uh, some in the office, some at home, uh, some um, in, in other locations, not necessarily in, in the office. And um, yeah, 10 years ago, it might have been a very, very different, uh, different story. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it's it, it's amazing. Were you surprised how quickly you were able to adapt to it? Yeah, yeah. I, I guess we were, took a, a very cautious approach um, with um, not understanding whether or not the um, uh, network would be able to handle uh, and the infrastructure would handle uh, the volume of people mm -hmm. uh, all remoting in um, at once. Uh, so we we very slowly uh, brought people on. Um, but uh, yeah, very very pleased to see that it was uh, quite effective and. Um, uh, yeah, no, uh, no real issues there. Um, I guess the, the the one thing that um, was a real concern and, and continues to be is those people in roles that might be spending days on end um, 
you know, buried in a, in a spreadsheet or you know, analyzing data and things like that, that that won't necessarily have interaction with, uh, with other team members. Um, in, in, in the office environment, they would still see them you know, at the coffee machine and in the mm -hmm. corridors, etc. So they would still get that uh, human in interaction, um, but not necessarily. So one thing that uh, we implemented very, um, very, very early on in the piece was the uh, concept of virtual coffee, uh, coffee breaks. Okay. So um, uh, just half an hour in everyone's diary, they were free to come and join uh, if, if they chose to. And just um, have a chat as we would. Um, oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> have a chat as we would if we were in the office, um, and uh, and it just ensures that they have that. Um, I'd like to oh, yeah. oh, well oh, done. Good shot. Sure. You can it's edit that bit out. <laughs> Yeah, so just give the um, uh, the team the opportunity to uh, to come together and, and have that social interaction. Um, the one challenge that we, we do have that um, we're still working through is uh, those with physical disabilities, uh, which don't necessarily allow them to um, um, uh, work uh, effectively uh, remotely. So um, we've, we've had to uh, make some allowances uh, for those. Okay. I'll move us to you. Where do you think we're going forward from here then? So we've had the changes. Are we, I mean, we don't know what is going to happen, but what do you foresee is going to happen? Now? I think working from home, first of all, isn't as scary as everyone thought it was going to be. Mm. It's quite accepted. Um, it, it was funny, so whenever the kids suddenly had to come and homeschool, I was obviously concerned for them but I thought what an amazing change management experiment you know how are they going to cope what's going to happen well my daughter was so upset with me she was like how can you find this interest <laughs> and I'm like no because really nobody gets thrown into this type of deep change mm. when they haven't foreseen it they haven't planned for it really and they just have to they have to survive and it's been wonderful to hear success stories I think the schooling side of things has not been so so great uh, but I think going forward it'll be a hybrid Mm. I, I can go into the office, um, but I'll probably go whenever the traffic's lighter. Yep. Like I don't want to. It, yep. it, there's that flexibility now that it's okay to go in for a part of the day and then do the rest from home or, or whatever you feel most comfortable with, yep. which has been really refreshing to mm. see. Do you feel, I guess, trust levels? I mean, we always want to say we trust our employees or trust our mentors or whatever it may be. But do you feel those trust levels have gone up and have had to go up? I think they've had to. I think it's been a natural, you, you really have to, you can't see what someone's doing anymore. It must be horrible for micromanagers, they must be <laughs> pulling their hair out. <laughs> they have no clue what's happening. <laughs> exactly. I mean, we, we have heard of, I mean, I've heard of, speaking with so many people in the market, but where Microsoft Teams is on 100% of the time, and you know, and you, you, I think it's the idle button. If you, you're away from your computer, it lets you know when they've been away from the computer too long. You know. It, for I me, phoned somebody from my mobile mm -hmm. and someone they answered and went, oh, old technology. <laughs> <laughs> wow, <laughs> okay. So the whole norm has completely changed. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, to do everything on Teams now is completely acceptable. And yeah, it's... Yeah, I love it. You know, um, I think you, you said it where that travel time, you know, yeah. do you go have to leave at the same time now? No, you can probably leave mid-morning. It's still going to be, it's actually going to take a shorter time. You start doing your emails or start doing work from home. It allows you to more time to work out at home because you don't have travel time. You do a home workout or whatever it may be. So, and you touch on it anyway. You have more time now. It seems to be more time. So, Peter, we'll go take it to you then. I mean, how have you found it? And then, what do you think is going to happen moving forward? Uh, we were quite fortunate in that we were had three remote locations having to work together already. So we had a lot of the tools and technology in place. So it was like business as usual basically. I was really impressed with how everyone got on with the job. Um, I think the thing, when I look at really high performing teams that I've seen in the past, and especially in the agile space, it's where they're highly collaborative, they're interacting, and they're working in the one space together, and they can grab each other and go, I need you, I've just got a problem, and it's solved just like that. And that ability becomes harder as we work through this technology, because we don't know if we can disrupt a person, and we don't know the right way to go about it. 
and we may resort back to sending emails and things instead. So we may accidentally take steps back. And I think what we're going to do is adapt and evolve and find new ways of disrupt, interrupting people and going, just need your help, can you help me with this? Mm -hmm. And do it in a way that like, allows teams to stay in the flow and it doesn't significantly impact them. So I think we'll adapt to our new situation and the tools that we have. And I think the tools and technology will get better over time mm -hmm. to allow that to happen too. So it'll feel almost like we're all in a room together. Yeah, so the visual cues, so I, I, anytime working with developers, anytime they don't want to be disturbed, the headphones go on and we know, don't go near. So those visual cues, because we can't have them any longer, they're just going to morph into some sort of technology mm -hmm. yeah. cues. The do not disturb button. The, yeah, the do not, yeah, people are going to get more serious about do not disturb, yeah. yeah, yeah. I think um, very early days, um, people were very conscious about um, uh, interruptions and I'm at work, so I can't be seen to... Um, uh, be interrupted and, and you'd be in a, a, um, in a, a video conference and you'd have uh, you know, a, a dog bark in the background or a child walk across and, and the, you could just see the person would be mortified. Um, <laughs> yeah. and, um, and it's like, it's, it's fine, just, mm. this, these things happen. This is, this is how we're working now. So um, uh, I think very quickly we got, got used to it and, and um, yeah, I'll, I'll be uh, sitting there talking to group executives and I'll say, I'll just have to put you on, uh, on hold for a minute because I've um, just got to help my, my daughter with the homework and, and, and things like that. And it's, uh, I think it's really great to see and, um, and it's just a very, very different culture that we're um, um, starting to, um, to, to breed now that um, those, those things are more acceptable. When, when you're at work, it's not just 100% work and nothing else. It's, um, you know, we'll, we have to adapt. But on the flip side of that, I've noticed that me being at home, my children, and I hope they don't see this because they'll kill me, um, they assume because I'm there, I'm available. Mm -hmm. And they get quite upset when I'm not. Mm -hmm. And trying to say, no, I'm still working, but you, you, you're not. You're not on a call. You're not doing this. You're, you're just sitting there looking at a computer. <laughs> you just need to put your headphones yeah, on. Yeah. Do this, <laughs> Visual cue. <laughs> I mean, moving forward, I guess, in regards to hiring then, uh, we were, I mean, we've already seen the flexible working hours, that would have already been involved, but are we going to be seeing more work from home 100% or come in when you need to? Do you think that's going to be more often? Because I mean, I was speaking to a number of CIOs uh, this week and they said, look, I probably don't need to have an office anymore, mm -hmm. you know, and I, is it going to go all that way? I mean, some of businesses can't, but when you guys start hiring again or when you hire, are you going to offer that? Do you think? Yeah, I think we, we've always been um, uh, promoting that we're, we've got a flexible working uh, environment. Uh, everyone has their laptops and, and we have the ability to work from home. Um, in, you know, practically not a lot of people were and um, most of the work was happening in the office. Um, these days and, and uh, looking to the future, it, it's really not a, not a concern how it happens, it's really just um, you come in and, and you can come to the office. Some people want to come in. Some people have to come in. Um, others um, are living you know, quite a, a way away. So we're happy for them to continue to work from home um, mm. uh, most of the time or all the time. So yeah, I, I don't think it's a, um, a real a constraint or something that we would mandate. And um, it's just a, yeah, as flexible as we need to be. And the agile tools make it possible for you to see that the work's getting done. Mm. I think that's a big thing. If those weren't in place, mm. it would be really hard to see that people were meeting deadlines, still on time, you know, everything was going smoothly. But with agile boards, you do get an early warning if something's mm. not going quite to plan. That's right. I think what's going to be a challenge going forward is if you're a new person coming into a new organisation, how do you build that rapport with the people that you need to, right? You, you've got Back in the office, you've got the lunch times, you've got the water cooler, you've got the corridor bumps, the high, how's it going, and how's your footy team? You struggle to have that. You, you now have to go out of your way to go and contact someone and go, hi, I just want to, how are you going with the football team, you know? Mm. Yeah. 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 yeah it must be difficult coming into a, an organisation and you build those, uh, especially the stakeholders, and um, um, not having that ability to, to have that first meet and greet. Yeah, right. I have one of my clients, he had three new starters this week. So he's had to come into the office and it was almost, it was weird for him to come into the office, but onboarding with three people at one time is hard enough. But then what's happened next, what happens next week? Does he go back in? How does he onboard it? You know, that, that connection there, like you said, it, it's gone. But this is a whole new skill that everyone's going to have to learn. Um, I guess moving forward then, um, what technologies do you think we might have to start using even more so? Because we're already using Teams, you know, is, I mean, we've already seen a number of technologies 
become more prevalent, but do you think we're going to have to, as a business, um, change our technologies overall? I think um, intranets are going to die, which I'll be so happy about because it really comes down to them, uh, and more two-way communication. I think that we realise the potential that employees have and keeping them engaged um, is so much more productive for the company and profitable that if there's more two-way engagement, um, immediate response to things. So there's certain platforms out there that can, that can cater for that and they're growing in popularity. Yeah, along similar lines, probably less reliance on, on emails and more with mm -hmm. the, the um, you know, collaboration tools like your, your Slack or your um, uh, mm -hmm. other, other chat, uh, chat tools there. Because um, I think they um, and have more just just quick conversational type um, yeah. um, chats, which you'd be you know, replacing those um, what you'd have in the office there, uh, and then that then doesn't um, uh, I guess uh, require the need to, to send the email. Uh, so uh, happy to see less less emails in my inbox. Yeah. What I have seen is we started using a tool called Miro um, online, which is very much about collaborating online as if it's a whiteboard space or something like that. Um, and in the past six months, they're doing more and more frequent releases. They're just going gangbusters with all the functionality, trying to replace all the things that you used to do in the office. And it's incredible. It is remarkable how much it replaces a lot of what you used to do. It's, mm -hmm. We use it for just about everything now. That's awesome. We um, implemented, not in Integral, but in the previous place, we integrated Workplace by Facebook. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the engagement was 90% immediately. Wow. It was just incredible and they very carefully selected what sort of groups you'd have in but you can prioritise what people see and that aggregated feed is something that's missing off a lot of the other yeah. collaboration channels that are available. Mm. But yeah, it was pretty amazing. Mm. Fantastic. Well, I think that wraps us up for the evening. Uh, I think we've covered all three topics quite well. Um, so I do thank all three of you. The insight's been great. Much more than mine. Um, so again, thank you very much, Emma. A, a special thank you to you for accepting the invitation such late notice. Uh, but I do thank <laughs> you very much. Uh, but hopefully, coming to the next forums, we can actually have it face to face. Have people come in and have a lot more interaction. Uh, but like we're talking about, maybe we can use technology a bit more and uh, actually have people interacting uh, elsewhere. But thank you very much, and uh, thank you for attending our uh, delivery forum. Thanks. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks, Brian. Cheers.